Welcome back, geology fans. In our last episode, we found that a volcano can kill you from near or far through the mechanisms of direct explosive impact, the heat of the lava, suffocating gases, climate change forcing, vaporization of toxic materials, ejection of toxic materials, acid rain, massive ash fall, volcanic bombs, pyroclastic flows, and lahars. How great would it be, then, if we could predict volcanoes before they erupt to get people out of harm's way? The good news is that we have learned several things that might precede an eruption. The bad news is that it is still not perfect, as the island of Japan has shown us in a couple of instances. Even the most expert volcanologist, Kadian Maurice Croft, could not predict the direction and size of the pyroclastic flow Mount Unzen produced in 1991. And in 2012, Mount Antake erupted without any of the warnings we will discuss today, killing 63 people. So, with the warning that we can never be 100% certain, let's look into the most successful modern techniques of volcanic eruption prediction. Hawaii has a rather regular pattern of inflation and deflation, back to inflation, what are known as DI cycles. These are detected with tilt meters around the mountain and show a pattern of inflation of the mountain to a point of failure, meaning eruption of the magma below to form lava at the surface, and then logically deflation takes place. Uh, the, when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, there was a swelling of the mountain, especially on the side that eventually failed in an enormous landslide, releasing the underlying magma explosively. Uh, however, at Yellowstone National Park, DI cycles have been observed with, thank goodness, no eruption involved with the peak of the inflation. The whole park seems to be alive, but in this case of a mantle plume below the continental park, we obviously can't rely on the DI cycles we've seen there so far to predict its truly catastrophic eruptions. Should a more rapid or drastic inflationary event take place there, then we should be a lot more wary. We noted before that magma underground is like a sealed, shaken soda under pressure. It's not just the pressure from the liquid magma causing our volcano to swell, but the gases coming out of that solution. Gases can get to the surface more easily than liquid rock, and so an increase in volcanic gases coming out of the ground might be another way to anticipate an eruption. This is the reason Mammoth Lakes in California is now a suspect area, as the gas output has increased recently. Very recently, a volcano in Peru was measured to have an increase in water vapor, steam output, right before a significant eruption. Other locations have seen increases in sulfur output before an eruption, so it's good to measure gas output of your local volcano and look for any anomalies. At Mammoth Lakes, geologists were not only measuring gas output, but extra heat output and increasing earthquake swarms in the area. If one observes more heat fluxing from the ground, it is a logical inference that hot magma is closer to the surface. We can use thermal infrared imaging to often locate spots like this one in the center of Mount St. Helens to infer magma near the surface and potential for future eruption. As for the increase in earthquakes, this makes sense as magma bodies pushing their way to the surface will pop and crack the rocks and even bubble and gurgle down below ground to create earthquakes often approaching the surface through time, coming up to the eruption. Earthquakes preceded the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and in this example of a seismic study to predict eruptions in Kamchatka, Siberia, geologists are placing seismometers all around the volcanic area to give better monitoring on this shaky matter. We can also measure the electrical resistivity of the ground in a volcanic area to locate magma bodies, or measure VLF, very low frequency emissions, which might tell how the magma is moving. So we use various instruments to measure ground deformation, gas output, heat output, earthquakes, and electrical properties. But we have a couple more techniques that don't use instrumentation. We can look at the historical record of a volcano and even date its eruptions with radiometric dating and start to get an idea of the periodicity of the volcano in question, keeping in mind that a volcano can still kill you without an eruption, as was seen in the previous episode. Now, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, but erupted before that in 1800, taking about 180 years between eruptions. That is considered a relatively short time for an active volcano to stay quiet. Now, the technical definition of an active volcano is one that has erupted in the last 10,000 years. Mount St. Helens is very active. 
Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991 after resting for about 400 years. But some of the larger eruptions on our planet have longer rest times that go up and over 10,000 years. The last really large eruption in New Zealand was about 180 AD. That volcano may not erupt again for 10 or 20,000 years, but it's probably going to erupt again. The Yellowstone supervolcano has a good eruptive record, letting us know it tends to erupt every you know, 600,000 years. When you get into that kind of long-time periodicity, we can certainly say that Yellowstone appears due for another major eruption soon, and so we should consider it an active volcano. But by soon, we are speaking geologically. That could be next week, or not in several generations to come. Yellowstone is thus investigated using all our methods of prediction because we still consider it an active volcano, even though it hasn't erupted in the last 10,000 years. Conversely, Dot Cerro is a volcano in Colorado that has erupted in the last 10,000 years, about 4,000 years ago, but we don't think it has enough magma to erupt again, and thus it's called an active volcano and is not considered by geologists to be truly future active, and thus the confusion of the public in hearing there's a nearby active volcano. But we may as well add in one last method of prediction that was also lightly touched on in earthquake prediction. This is strange animal behavior. There are plenty of stories about a cat, dog, fish, butterflies, horses, chickens, pigs, goats acting strange right before an eruption or an earthquake. Perhaps animals are detecting something beyond our senses that clues them off to these impending disasters. But there is a real problem here. If your animal acts strange and a strange event occurs... You will take note and perhaps report that. If your animal acts strange and nothing happens, nothing happens. Not reporting all cases of animal behavior leads to a biased data set which is scientifically unreliable. Stories are anecdotal evidence and the plural of anecdote is not data. Nevertheless, if I am in an area I know is historically, geologically, prone to earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, and the animals around me start acting strangely, I'm going to take note. If all the animals are running uphill or downhill, I might try to reason why it might be a good idea, and if I should join in with their rapid migration. Though animal behavior may not be considered the best prediction tool, the rest of the tools in the kit are much more relied on, and getting this data can often be very dangerous work, and should be valued all the more for that reason. So if trained volcanologists with modern instrumentation say they feel an eruption is imminent, take it seriously. Volcanology's predictive record may not be perfect, but it is much better than, well, let's say, shamans and witch doctors talking to volcano gods, or just mere guesswork. Knowledge is power, and so we will continue in our current vein of geologic hazards, learning how to recognize and mitigate the various forms of what we call mass movement. Landslides, mudslides, debris flows, creeping soil, and subsidence will be met in our next episode, here on Earth Explorations.